we're in part seven of our nine-part series on God's eternal purpose. And we're in part three of the part inside of there of God looking for a home. And today we're talking about how God is building that home. Too many people have come to know Jesus today in the same way that some of you came to know your bank. You picked a bank because the bank said you're going to get free checking and a free toaster. <laughs> Except, you know, nowadays it's kind of hard to find those places that give you the free toaster. But churches today seem to want to bring people into the church by offering them this peachy, rosy life where everything's just going to be great once you start following Jesus. As soon as you accept Jesus, as soon as you come up out of baptism, the world is just going to be so much better. Well, I still haven't got that toaster. Life is still a mess for me. I don't know about you, but life is a mess. Last night I opened up my email and Cox Cable said I owed them $900. <laughs> what? And of course, Sunday night, you know, or Saturday night, you can't call them till Monday. And I think, Jesus, everything was supposed to be better when I became a Christian. In this world today, we, we face cancers. We face diseases. We face economics that are terrible. We face presidential debates. We face all kinds of things that make us understand, well, this world is still very broken and I'm still living in it. Christ told people, if you're going to follow him, the first thing you do is count the cost. It's going to cost to follow Jesus. Now, he makes it in an active sense that there are going to be people that hate us because of his name, and there's going to be times where we suffer because of our principles and our faith in him, and we don't follow the ways of the world or trust in the evidence that the world presents. But I want to talk to you about something a little more passive that we have a harder time dealing with emotionally, and that's how God builds the home that he wants to live in. In Revelation, we heard that there's this announcement that God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. And we kind of want that to be right now. We talk about Jesus living in us, the Holy Spirit guiding us, the Father always with us. Where two or more are gathered, there he is. But there's something much more final about the announcement in Revelation. Rather than what we have in faith now, we will have before us at that time. I heard an old preacher once say that God created the, the earth in six days, rested on the seventh. But if you read scripture carefully, Jesus is going off to prepare a place. Heaven's not even done yet, and it's been several thousand years. It must be glorious. Well, I don't know how God deals with time. But I do know that only Christ has come from heaven and explained to us that there is room and that that room is being prepared for us. And we've talked about how the, we are betrothed to this man. And we are waiting for that day for him to come and say, the wedding feast is now. And we will go and we will live in this home that he has prepared. But what does this home look like? Revelation chapters 21 and 22 give us a mind-boggling portrait of the house of God, especially the building materials. And he says, we are the bricks of his house. Now, I knew I was hard-headed, but I'm the brick of his house? I thought I was the bride of his son. The Bible's kind of funny this way. You see, when we read in Revelation, we find out that the house is a city that he's going to live in. And we find out that the city, well, it's also his bride. And that the bride is also a dwelling place. And that the dwelling place is his wife. And that his wife, well, she's a temple. And the temple is a garden. Bringing us right back to the very beginning where Adam could not find his perfect mate. And so God put him to sleep and took the mate right out of him. And he woke up and said, wow, man. 
And Jesus could not find the church that he was looking for. And so he hung on the cross. And out of his side, God pulled the blood that washed us so that when Jesus woke up in three days, his bride was waiting for him. You see, these two chapters of Revelation beg for us to turn back to our Bibles and start reading those stories that we've heard all of our lives again and understand that they are a shadow of every promise God has made to us. But we beg and we wait in this life thinking things ought to be better. I'm under so much pressure. I'm under so much trouble. I'm a, there's so many things going on. How many of you ladies have, have lost a little bit of sleep about the bazaar? Yeah? But isn't the bazaar supposed to be something good? When do you have the most fun at the bazaar? During the preparation? Or when it's just about over? <laughs> you know, I've done, I've done at least a couple of weddings in my 30 years of ministry. And what I always find out is that the, the bride is absolutely terrified, nervous until the day she starts walking down that aisle. The groom, on the other hand, yeah, it's all going to work out. It's all going to be fine until the day she starts walking down the aisle. <laughs> we go back to the stories of Scripture and we realize they're full of trouble. They're full of pressure. They're full of the unknown. And all God promises us is endure, overcome. There is an end to this. How many of you suffer in this life from health, finances, family disobedience, bad bosses, horrible jobs, flat tires, and you wonder, because you've heard it in your life, God's punishing me for something. Stop it. Just stop it. Because when I was a young boy, I suffered from horrible, horrible allergies. They kept me out of school. They kept me out indoors and out of the outside. And they weren't sneezing and coughing. Mine were skin allergies that made me, in my opinion, hideous to look at. And never once did my mother take me to the doctor and say to me, you're going to the doctor because you're being punished. She never once held me down when the doctor was giving me the injection and say, you're getting an injection because you're a bad person. She took me to the doctor and the doctor healed me. No matter how much I screamed and hollered and fussed. I mean, hey, at 21, I just didn't know what was going on. <laughs> The city of God is made from us. We're the building blocks. What does it say that city is made out of as it describes that city? It says that the city was made of gold. The city was made of gems. And the city was made of pearls. And you are those building blocks. Now, personally, I hate the self-esteem movement. I read the prophets of the Old Testament and every one of them suffered from bad self-esteem. I'm not good enough. I don't speak so well. And God just said, I don't care. Go do what I've told you to do. Because in everybody I've counseled and everybody I've ministered to, we get down to the root of their problems in life and they say, I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough. And my answer to you is, <laughs> yeah, you're right. That's why Jesus died on the cross. And it wasn't just to forgive us and say, well, it's done, you're not good enough. There's a different purpose besides just forgiving our sins. He's working out something. Let's take a look at these building materials a little bit more closely and see what the symbology is and why would God choose these things as the building blocks for his temple, his city, his bride. Gold is exquisite and imperishable. It doesn't 
decay, it doesn't rust, and it doesn't tarnish. It retains its beauty eternally. And it is the most malleable of valuable, of valuable metals. Malleable, it means that you can change it. What parent here doesn't want to change their child about something? What teacher wants their, their students just to remain the same? No, you want them to be malleable, changeable. And gold is this valuable, beautiful, incorruptible, and yet moldable material that God is working on in you. It's purified by fire. How many of you have gone through the fire this week? The fire you're going through is not because God is punishing you. He's healing you. He is putting the fire to you so that the gold will be findable among the debris. And we have Job and Zechariah and 1 Peter that repeat, you are being fired so that the scum can be pulled away from your life and the Gold can be brought out. In the Bible, gold is timeless and eternal. It's a symbol of the divine nature being worked into you by that fire and by the skill of the master workman. You don't feel like you have worth? Okay, let me agree with you. I don't feel like I have any worth. I, I suffer from depression. I feel like I'm not good enough. I sometimes wonder why God called me to be a pastor at all. Because I know me. And yet he says, I don't care. You're a vessel, and I'm going to fill up the vessel with the valuable wine. So I try to fill myself up with the valuable... Oh, no, wait. wait. <laughs> I let him fill me up with his value and his gold. God has been working the gold into you in your life. You're here because of your troubles. You're here because of your blessings. You're here because of your ailments, and you're here because of your victories. And God is using those like the, the jeweler uses the drill and the hammer to turn you in to beauty and gold. But what about gems? Gems are a little different than gold. They are made out of simple carbon in most cases. An abundant material, and yet through indescribable pressure, they are turned into valuable baubles. You know what carbon is, don't you? How many of you have a fireplace? Don't you love cleaning that out? If you could provide the pressure that the Earth's core provides, well, you could be turning your fireplace into a moneymaker. But it's beyond my ability, at least an affordable ability. It's also produced by unimaginable heat. Did you know that when you provide pressure, it also produces heat on its own? Through unimaginable pressure and unimaginable heat and through a long period of formation, simple carbon produces diamonds. You don't want to go through a pressure. You don't want to go through the heat. You want to get out of the kitchen? Jump back in because you're being made into a diamond. You are being made into a valuable, precious, beautiful reflector of light that everyone desires. Especially, you know, woman is, I mean, diamond is a girl's best friend. I don't know about that. I know a lot of people that seek them out. The Bible talks of long-suffering. How many times do we see in the Bible endure long-suffering? This carbon, if it could talk, would say, I am so done with this heat and pressure. I can't take it anymore. I, I'm just going to explode. No, you're not. Endure. And what comes out is going to be what God has made us. He throws in the ingredients he throws us into the world, and we form a community bound together in heat and pressure making the church. Have you got someone in this congregation 
right here in this room, not, not out in the city, this room that has hurt you? Is there someone in this family that it's been difficult for you to forgive for one reason or another? Pressure. Heat is creating the family that will not fall apart. God is blessing you and making you into diamonds. The troubles of this church are not, are not design flaws. They're design. The problems that you're going through as a church are not the result of God's punishment. They're the result of God's plan to take you out of a broken world, put you into a group of people, and apply the heat and pressure in the right way. Pressure never killed anyone. It's where the pressure is applied. You can punch somebody in the arm with 15 pounds of pressure, and they just say, hey... Or you can poach somebody in the eye with one pound of pressure and you're going to jail. Pressure never killed anybody. It's where the pressure is applied. If the pressure is on the outside, it'll push you towards God. But if the pressure is between you and God, it'll push you away. And that's true for each other. You, you have been being formed by God into diamonds. Don't miss an opportunity to go to the person that hurt you and bind to them. Become diamonds together and pearls. Now, I have to tell you, folks, I've never quite understood pearls. They're pretty, but I've never really... My grandmother loved these things, these little white balls, until I realized they weren't plastic. You know, when you're a little kid, you think they're plastic. And then I learned all about pearls living in Taiwan. They, they are not perfect little round balls if they're real. You ever, you ever you seen the test for a real pearl? You rub it on your teeth, and if it feels like sandpaper, it's a real pearl. If it's smooth, it's just glass or plastic. Pearls are very interesting. Pearls are rare and, believe it or not, are considered unnatural. Even though they come from the oyster, which seems like a very natural creature, until you eat one and you realize there's nothing natural about oysters. <laughs> this natural creature produces an unnatural, rare, valuable item. And it does that through an irritant. The farmer of the pearls takes a piece of sand or a piece of glass and puts it into the oyster. And that sand irritates the oyster. And some of you parents already know where I'm going with this, don't you? The irritant is what produces the pearl. As the oyster is irritated, scar tissue forms uh, around this item that's causing irritation to form a protective layer. We call them calluses. Any of you got feet that you can sand wood with? You know, that's a callus. It's called a knacker or nacre for the oyster. And it forms this perfect or nearly perfect circle around the irritant to protect the oyster from the irritation. And thousands of layers of this, cal this, this deposit of skin or, or scar tissue takes eight years before a pearl can be produced that is valuable to the farmer. It just so happens that eight years is the lifespan of an oyster. You ever feel irritated? Man, I could, I could speak for hours about Taiwan traffic and learning how to cuss just because of Taiwan traffic because I never cussed before Taiwan traffic, ever. You ever been irritated? You see, we think that the big things in life are what destroy us. Cancer, presidential elections. <laughs> we think those destroy us. But do you know what really gets to us, what beats us down, 
are the minor irritants that keep eating and eating and eating at your day. You know what I'm talking about. That one day when you really want to concentrate on something and get something done and you have 500 phone calls. The day before, you didn't have any. When your beautiful and lovely grandchild keeps saying, but why? All these things that we don't think of as being particularly bad, Satan uses to wear us down like sandpaper, like an irritant. We think the scar tissue is something bad. It's there to protect us. And when the master jeweler takes that scar tissue of a lifetime and touches it, it creates valuable works of art. He's looking for the pearls that you produce in a life of faith. A life of faith that is stronger than the irritants. A life of faith that is more reliable than the irritation. A life of faith that works around the scar tissue and continues to go on. God has been introducing beauty into you through your irritations. You are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. I have never, ever seen a stonemason just take a rock right out of the ground and make a perfect fitting. He takes a tool to it. And God is taking a tool to you. In my case, it's a croquet mallet, but still, it's a tool. And he's forming me into something that I wasn't. I wasn't that thing. And you know what? I don't know about you, but I don't want to get up early in the morning and I don't want to go do chores and I don't want to face those problems. But he says, I'm making you into gold, into gems, and into pearls for his purpose, for his building. A home that God wants to live in. Beautiful to look at. Eternal. Uncorruptible. And the cross is the tool that he is using to do that. Through Jesus Christ's forgiveness for our sins, but also, also through the promise of eternal life, we overcome sin. Not because I stop sinning. The law doesn't help me do that. The love of Christ says, Michael, I expected better from you today. Ugh! What, can you just punish me? No. I'm trying to make you better. I'd rather be punished sometimes. It's over with. But making me better says I've got to get my sums right. I've got to get the right answer. And when I don't, he says it's okay. We're still working. You see, gold comes from a forge, and forges are hot. Gems come from pressure, and pressure is difficult to endure. And pearls come from irritations that just won't seem to stop. You going through those? What's your prayer life? To get those removed? Or is your prayer life to get those applied to the proper place? To change you into the person that endures these things and says, I can overcome these things. Well, God's changing you. And he's making you into the place that he wants to live forever. All of human history is God Manning the forge, pressing the levers, hammering the materials, all for the production of one thing, you. Because he's after you. He wants you. Well, if he loved me, he would accept me the way I am. I never once told my mom, if he loved me, he would let me remain in pain and not take me to the doctor. I, of course, now that I'm older... 
I've said that to my wife. No, I'm not going to the doctor. I'm fine. He's producing you so that he can produce the home that he wants to live in. Take your blessings, whether they are the blessings of winning the lottery or the blessings of, you know, having a big doctor bill. Did you know they're both blessings? If you don't know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about it sometime. But do you think that there is anything you are facing this week or in your life? Is there anything that you are facing that can change God's plans for your life? Do you think a bankruptcy can change his plans? A car wreck? A cancer? Do you think there's anything that happens in this world, in this church or in this life, that are going to say to him, Oh, Michael, I can't use you. I'm sorry. I'm going to give up on you. Nothing. Nothing will change the artist's plans in your life. And you will become what he expected you to be. Next week on part eight, we're going to talk about the body. Christ is also building a body because he's a bodybuilder. And that body is a family. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for not only the things that, that we look forward to as blessings, but we thank you for the healing. We thank you for the endurance that you teach us. We thank you because you became a man and you endured this world and you endured the cross and you shared in our suffering. And you hold us and you tell us everything will be all right. Everything will be made better. Lord, comfort us in our troubles. Comfort us in our disagreements. Help your church to heal. Not because we are the best people, but because you are the best Father. And you teach us and show us through Christ how to forgive and how to love. Build your body out of us. In Jesus' name, amen.